So the scripture today is going to come from uh, Proverbs chapter 15, verse 22. And if you would open your Bibles there, uh, we'll, go, we'll go through it. I've got some things to say and we'll look at the scripture too. Now, <clears throat> we need to remember that we are in the information age. We are definitely in the information age. There is so much information going around that we communicate now instead of face to face. We communicate with emojis. <laughs> Did you know that emojis, the use of emojis in two years, has catapulted from nothing to 775% more than in the year before? We are now using emojis far more than anything. Some of you use emojis when you're texting back to me, and it's fun. And texting is incredible. Did you know that the average teenager will send more than 100 text messages a day? Average. And so that's incredible. So that's about 3,000 texts a month. And so you wonder why your batteries are running down. That's a good thing. So we know that there are a lot of te uh, texting activities take place. Uh, this is a chart based upon a Pew study that was done by uh, young people from 12 to 17. So 17 percent, or on the age 17, 77 percent of those teens do text messaging. That's a lot of teenagers, isn't it? And you wonder why your bill is high. They talk on a landline phone only 36 percent of the time. Uh, they may not even know what a landline phone is. We, we may have to bring one in and demonstrate it. Uh, and so actually 60% of this age group uh, talk on cell phones. I mean, they actually call on a cell phone and expect a voice. Social network, 40% of the 15-year-olds are on Facebook, Instagram, not, not Twitter so much. Snapchat and others so you can see where a lot of the communication is going on and so then after actual conversations face to face this was interesting to me is that the 15 year olds only 42 percent only 42 percent or actually 42 percent do talk face to face that was kind of uh, reassuring uh, email see teens don't do quite as much email as uh, adults do in the category 28 to 45, by the end of this year, there will be 3.7 trillion emails sent to 4.7 billion users of email. So we do a lot of things, and so we just do stuff, and so we do things to connect. We do things to do all kinds of things. However, with statistics, you always have to take it to a grain of salt. And uh, the reason that you do is Mark Twain says there are three kinds of lies. First, there's lies, second, damned lies, and finally, st uh, statistics. So you just have to take all of these numbers with a grain of salt. So we need to ask the question in, in this day and time, what are we looking for? What are we looking for? Well, whenever we text or whenever we talk or whenever we get together, no matter what we do, we are looking for relational connections. So a lot of times what we're bemoaning is the fact that we have people whose only social interaction is through their smartphone. Don't raise your hand. And so we're looking to see there. A lot of us are looking for likes on Facebook, Twitter, whatever, and that's because we desire to be validated personally. And so if everybody else sees how many times we're liked, then we know we're really doing good. And so we also look for a sense of belonging. If I'm part of a certain group, then I can get messages from others in the group. Um, I'm part of a couple of other groups on Twitter, uh, Cold War Submariners, and uh, there's another one, Nuclear Power School graduates, and a couple of things that are relatively small. So there's all kinds of things that we do on social media as well as hear from others and a lot of it has to do with where are we where are we going where can I get help where can I understand what to do the other thing is is that oftentimes we're looking for approval um, 
back in March, whenever we did the uh, <clears throat> whenever we did the prayer at the state senate, and Pastor Allen was with me. Uh, then I put that I put that up there on Facebook, and lo and behold, people I haven't heard from in, in a long time said, "Wow, way to go, Pastor Jerry!" You know, I mean, it was just all, and I just really felt good about it. <laughs> <laughs> I think my problem is I have never not felt good about myself. So what we can see is that sometimes we're looking for guidance. What do you think I ought to do? Do you think I ought to do this? Dear Abby, has anybody ever read Dear Abby or the guy at Vice Columbus? No? Yeah. Who, who knows who, who Dear Abby is? <laughs> oh, a lot of you do. Okay. And so it's got all these lame situations, and most of the time people write in with these supposed questions about ethics or behavior, and I read those sometimes, and I go, if only they knew Jesus, they'd have the answer. <laughs> and so that's one of the things that we need to do. So whenever we think of what we're looking for, we need to understand that already in Christ, we are accepted, we are secure, and we are significant. And God did that for us through our belief, our faith in Jesus Christ. The promise was already there. We apprehended it. Now we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within that will guide us. So one of the things we need to remember is on the journey, there are certain things that we're looking for. And so we're not looking for the relational connections, but one of the things that we need to be looking for as we look today at the text is we need to admit, and I'm guilty, we need to admit that one of the most difficult things in life is to know what you don't know. Yes. How many of you have been afraid to say, I don't know? How many of you have not been afraid to say, I don't care? How many of you have been not afraid to go, whatever? So, I mean, you know, you can just see all of these things play out in human emotions. This picture up here is an interesting picture. Uh, this is a fishing boat in New Zealand, about a 65-footer that went ashore on one of the islands in New Zealand and crashed, and of course now it's worthless. And so the reason that went on the rocks is because the 17-year-old helmsman fell asleep. So if you, if you metaphorically move it into life, we can see that whenever we fall asleep at the wheel, and that was the name of the singing group, I know. If we fall asleep at the wheel of life, we can see that events will push us onto the rocks. Even our bad decisions or no decision can push you onto the rocks of life. So we need to remember once again that our direction is going to determine our destination. His direction of no action of steering according to a compass to deeper water put his destination to be on the rocks. 17 years old, they left him alone. The captain and the mates were down below sleeping and he ran this thing onto the shore. So uh, that happens a lot of it. So sometimes what we do is we go, well, I just feel in my heart. Well, your heart can lie to you. I mean, it really can. I was, the first thing that came to mind whenever I thought of that is Celine Dion singing, my heart will go on, you know. You know, I, I can't. Don't try it. Nah, I was kidding. Please, there you go. Yeah. So on the bow of the Titanic, you know, here they are singing, my heart will go on, even though that ship went to the bottom. So once again, they should have done a course correction. And uh, one of the things we learned recently was don't inflict pain on the congregation, so I won't sing the Celine Dion song. And <clears throat> so the question is, is how do I get through this test in my life? And a test is not pass-fail. A test is to determine purity. In other words, like metal, gold, if it's pure gold, it's 24 karat. I don't know where they got carats. They don't spell it with a C. They didn't ask me, but that's pure gold. If you get 14 karat, it's a little, got a bunch of other stuff in it. If it turns green, it's not gold at all. So we need to know how do I come out of this fully tested, and being able to walk with God in a significant way according to his plans and purposes. So Solomon says this. This is really profound. 
plans fail for the lack of counsel. That's not therapists. That, that's not therapists. Oftentimes what it says is advocates. And so the Holy Spirit is oftentimes called an advocate. Now, it's interesting. I was in the Netherlands uh, way back when, uh, speaking at some conferences, and one of my, my hosts was, an, was what they call in the Netherlands an advocate or an advocate. And that meant that a lawyer, he was an attorney that was uh, qualified to speak before the Supreme Court in the Kingdom of the Netherlands. And so that's a pretty high achievement. And so that's the same thing that the Holy Spirit is for us. He is our advocate. He is entitled, authorized, and acquainted with speaking on behalf of us, just like Jesus does before the throne of God the Father Almighty. So we need to think of the council, it's not a therapist, where, um, where we just think of somewhere to unload our problems. It's somebody that can inform us about God's ways, God's words, God's plans, and God's care for you as you minister to others. It's very important that we understand that we are under the care of an advocate, somebody who goes to bat for us, before the Father, and so of course as we pray to Jesus Christ, and we pray to God the Father, we pray by the Holy Spirit, and we watch as our lives change because we are utilizing the services of an advocate. I know sometimes here in this day and time, we have to use an attorney. We have to use an attorney to navigate the court sessions. We have to use an attorney to navigate navigate with other people who are not behaving properly in civil matters. And so even if, um, even if you're involved in a criminal thing, one of the great words that you hear, you hear it on television all the time, and it is this. Don't tell me if you've heard this from a policeman. If you desire to have an attorney, one will be appointed for you. And so we know that that is a very important thing in our life is to have an advocate, which is the Holy Spirit. So Solomon says this, plans fail for a lack of, of an advocate, but with many advisors, they succeed. In other words, um, you're going to need to understand that you have to choose the good advice of good people. You're going to have to just not get an echo chamber of other people to repeat that stuff back to you. Oh, yeah, that's nice. I'm glad. I'm glad for you. Yes, God bless you. Uh, if you won't be fed, be on your way. Uh, get out of my life. I've had enough. And uh, so that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is uh, people that will just do their own thing. In the last line of Judges, it says this, the book of Judges. It says, and every man did what was in his own heart because there was no king in Israel. That's kind of horrible words, isn't it? And you realize how bad the stuff was there at the end of the book of Judges. And I mean, my goodness, this is the chosen people of God that he brought out of uh, Egypt not too long ago. Through the Red Sea, through the wilderness, across the Jordan, fed them manna, fed them quail, everything. Okay, so we need to ask a question. Why don't we seek advice? If advice is very important, we need to know what are some of the facts and we can identify them in our own mind? First of all, we may be ignorant. Don't raise your hand. We think we already know what we need to know. I know that. And so we stumble on our way. Sometimes we say it feels better to have think we, people think we know where we're going than to let them know we don't have a clue. <laughs> I've told this story before. We moved to Pascagoula, Mississippi, and we moved down there. There's a significant African-American population, and they all speak with a definite accent their own. I was at a job and with my new boss and uh, had the concrete truck driver was there, and uh, he was uh, pouring it out into a big footing, and then he said in the black uh, dialect, uh, he asked me a question, I said, no, no, that's okay. I said, and then about 30 seconds later, I said, could you back up about three feet? And my boss, who had grown up in the South, said, 
That's what he just asked you. <laughs> so I learned how to speak the language. And uh, so, I mean, I was too, too proud to admit that I didn't understand what he said. Instead of turning to him and saying, what did you say? You know, I, I just faked it. And I got found out. Okay? So we know that those kind of things happen all the time. How many of you have been in a difficult place where you didn't know what you were doing, somebody asked you, did you need any help, and you said, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> we got a few, a few honest folks. That's good. Okay. We don't seek advice oftentimes because it's too much work to figure out how to get advice. How many of you, instead of uh, opening a book, or a manual, we'll go to Google. Or YouTube. Well, we're getting a lot of uh, guilty people here. Uh, that's okay, God forgives you. Um, so there's a lot of times when books don't cover what we do, but we'll get to something that does here in a moment. Sometimes it's also, we find that it's easier to get advice from our friends because they won't, they won't give us bad advice thinking that we might reject them. So we have a fear of rejection oftentimes. So you ask your friends, hey, I'm thinking about starting a brand new motorcycle dealership. What do you think? And they'll go, oh, Pastor Jerry, that'd be great. You ride motorcycles. Why don't you go ahead and start one? Never mind that I don't have any money. Number two, I have no manufacturer connections. Number three, I don't have a site. And number four, I wouldn't know what to do. So you see, but our, our friends, oftentimes for us, they want us to be able to do whatever we want them, whatever we want to do. So it's kind of a trap. So maybe it's not best to ask your friends. You can oftentimes tell your friends that you're going to do something. How about this one? It's always easier to follow the herd. Yeah. No. Peer pressure. You ever heard of that one? That's not based on a structure that extends out into the ocean. That's based on your friends wanting you to do the same things that they're doing so that you can share the disappointment that they're feeling. <laughs> Peer pressure. Okay. And this one, if you're young, it's easier to copy what your parents did instead of break new ground, instead of trying to figure out what you should be doing. So let's take a look. How do I get good counsel? And so number one, you got to know that you will always need good counsel. Always need good counsel. I wanted to go shooting one day. I couldn't hit the target. Everything was going over. Tim Thurman had me sit down and watch a video of a, a very seasoned and championship level shooter talk about how to properly hold a handgun. And so then Tim coached me as I did it. And so I gradually got to where I could hit the target every now and then. So that was major progress. So you're always going to need good counsel. Uh, you got to ask more than one person's advice. If you're facing a major decision, you need to ask more than one person's advice. What do you think I ought to be doing? What do you think would happen? What's the collateral damage going to be? Where is this all going to land? It's always good to ask somebody else's advice. But you're only going to have to do it with mature people. you got to have mature people that you trust. That's why it's so important that we gather as the Fellowship of the Saints because we have many in here that have experienced the same thing that we're needing help with and they can help us. You can say to somebody, yes, I tried that, but here's what happened with me. And you can share your failure because your failure in life may lead the other person to a success without experiencing your failure. So you don't necessarily want everybody to reproduce your failures. Any counsel that we give has to be grounded on God's Word. Otherwise, it's just opinion. There's a difference. There is actually an opinion page in the paper, and that is where all these individuals with a massive amount of time have written in. They do it on Facebook. They do it on Twitter. They do it on Instagram, Snapchat, all of these. You have tons of opinions. We used to say that sometimes that... <clears throat> 
opinions are like belly buttons. Everybody has one and they're all filled with lint. So you need to understand that not all opinions are valid, even when it comes from some supposed great source. Not all opinions are valid. So you're going to have to get the opinions, you're going to have to get the words that are grounded on God's word, not what you want to hear. If you're coming already asking and you know what you want to hear, uh, a good uh, mature person may not, may not tell you what you want to hear. How many of you have heard a basic disappointment when you came to somebody with a question that you thought was a fantastic idea? Okay, got the right crowd. Okay, also don't let pride keep you from admitting what you don't know. Oh yeah, I already know that. That's a sure sign, no you don't. And so you can see it in various endeavors. You can see all of these kind of things. Do you know how to operate this? Oh yeah, I've done it all the time. When, in your dreams? You know, you just need to be really truthful about it and so you can go from there. The other one was uh, take counsel from those who have been where you want to go. So in other words, if you want to become spiritually mature, if you want to walk out God's purpose in your life, find one of the brothers or the sisters appropriately that knows and has gone through the struggle and that's where they have wound up. Now it doesn't mean that only a divorced person can give counsel to one who is thinking about getting divorced. That, that's probably not good. And so what you need to do is you need to find somebody that's been married for a long time and has gone through all of the trials and tribulations and uh, uh, understands what it means to self-sacrifice and give up everything for the other party. And so that's a very important thing. Where do you want to go? See, a lot of times people will come into the office and I will say, where do you want to be in five years? See, that's a good question, huh? Because the direction is going to determine the destination. And so if they tell me something wild, I want to be in the movies or whatever, and we'll go, okay, we'll take a video of you and post it, see if anybody subscribes or buys the film. And so we just need to understand that us getting good counsel is very important. Now there's a key verse in Proverbs, it's Proverbs chapter 12, 15, and it says this, out of the message, it says, fools are headstrong and do what they like, wise people take advice. Does that sound realistic? Okay. Have any of you ever met any headstrong people? <laughs> okay. Oftentimes we find it in church. One of the things that Rick Allen told us about was he had to mediate an argument in a big church, and the argument was in the new building that was going to seat a large population, is he had to meet, mediate between two groups. One of them wanted green carpet, and the other one a blue carpet. One lady said that God had told her it was supposed to be blue carpet. The other guy said, no, no. He said, it's supposed to be green carpet. And so they had this big fight that was going to split the church over the color of the carpet. Yeah. That's what they did. They put in red. And so what we need to understand <clears throat> is that sometimes we need to just lay our own God said. We need to say lay, lay that to the side. You got to back it up with God's word. Remember, we have sometimes talked about the way that you judge something that somebody says is you've got personal opinions, you've got community standards, and you've got biblical absolutes. And so, if somebody says the carpet has to be blue like the sky in heaven, that's somebody's opinion. If somebody says, "Wow, we all like blue carpet, red carpet, green carpet, beige carpet." charcoal carpet, then that's a community thing. If God says you can worship him with two or three others no matter where you're at, then that's what we're going to go with because that's a biblical absolute. See, if, I, if we were going to build another church uh, building, what we would do is we would probably have no carpet because then you can arrange everything. You can stain the concrete different colors. That we're going to do. So, um, if you doubt me, go over to the Switchback Grill in uh, Springdale and look in the cafe on the floor.
and you'll see how beautiful it is. Or go to Walmart and look at the floor after they took up the tile. Okay, now i got to tell you a Bible story to illustrate this about fools are headstrong and do what they like. Wise people take advice. This is a guy here, if you turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 10 uh, in your Bible, there's a great story here that illustrates the proverb. This guy standing up is, uh, this is Rehoboam right here, and this is Jeroboam, and they're kind of half-brothers. Uh, this guy is the son of Solomon. Solomon has just died, and this guy was born of a concubine to Solomon. So we can see here in 2 Chronicles, if you don't know where it is, turn to the index. 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 10, and the whole chapter is about this particular incident. And so you can look at it on, uh, on your smartphone too. Um, so it says here, when he gets his glasses on, it says here that Rehoboam went to Shechem for all the Israelites had gone there to make him king. Now when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard this, he was in Egypt, and he returned from Egypt. He's just come back from Egypt because he had to hide from Solomon. Okay? All political stuff goes that way. So they sent for Jeroboam, and he and all Israel went to Rehoboam and said, Your father put a heavy yoke on us, but now lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke he put on us, and we will serve you. And Rehoboam said, Come back to me in three days. So the people went away. Then King Rehoboam consulted the elders, his father's advisors. They were the ones that had made him the greatest king Israel ever had. They expanded his territories. They multiplied his wealth. These are the guys that had done that, and here's what they said. They said, they said this, If you will be kind to these people and please them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servants. But Rehoboam rejected the advice the elders gave him and consulted the young men. Now these young men had all grown up in the court setting. None of them had ever made payroll. None of them had ever uh, uh, ruled in any kind of a thing. They had all been those that hung around the court because of their order of birth and so forth. And so he talks to them and he said, what's your advice? How should we answer these people who say to me, lighten the yoke your father put upon me? And so the young men who had grown up with him, remember, they are all, cat, they are all cat, kids from the castle. And so he says, these guys tell him, hey, tell the people who have said to you, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but our, make our yoke lighter, tell them, my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. My father laid on you a heavy yoke. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I'm going to scourge you with scorpions. And later on, Jeroboam and everybody came, came together and they went, Wow, that sounds great! <laughs> no, they didn't. No, they didn't. See, that's the same kind of trick that the enemy often uses on us. He says... He says that judgment is coming to you because of all of the bad things to do and that you've done. And the only thing that you need to do is go, no, no, the past is past. I am here, and I am here with Jesus Christ. The past is past. It's over. And so if you want a piece of me, come on, because I am hidden with Christ in God. Don't you remember that big ugly stick on Calvary that beat the stew out of you? So we need to, take, we need to shift our minds. So here's what happened. Here's what happened. So they came back to Rehoboam with Jeroboam and all the people, and the king answered them harshly, <coughs> rejecting the advice of the elders. That's the key thing. He rejected the advice of the elders, <coughs> men that had made Solomon wealthy, prosperous, large territories, everything else. They reject their opinion and they go with the kids. 
the spoiled kids. And he says, and he tells them that. So the king didn't listen to the people for this turn of events, but it was on God's hand to fulfill the word that the Lord had spoken to Jeroboam, Jeroboam son of Nebat, to Ahijah the Shilonite. And so then when all Israel, the ten northern tribes, saw what the king saw that the king refused to listen, they said, Hey, we're not with you anymore. We're going home. And so the ten tribes went off and established a rulership of their own. So we can see here, and even in Israel's history, and probably in your own, where I can in mine, where I rejected the advice of seasoned citizens and went with what I thought I knew best. Remember, your heart will deceive you. Because unless your mind is transformed, you're going to be listening to other people's voices and you're going to be operating according to somebody else's agenda. I've told the story before when I was in high school. I did really bad in high school algebra. And this was at the time when Sputnik had just been launched, so everybody was supposed to be a space engineer. And so I did bad in algebra, so I had to go to, I didn't fail, I got a D. So I had to go to summer school to go ahead and raise it up to a B. And so I did. And so the guy, the, the teacher that was there told me, he said, Van I. Warden, he said, you're never going to go any further in mathematics than this. And I believed him. I believed him because he was an educator. And so I thought he would know about what kids like me are going to turn out. And so I went and I took metal shop, wood shop, I took advanced metal shop, I took advanced biology, I took botany, I took all kinds of things, no more mathematics, nothing. So then I find myself getting out of high school. I tried a year of college and I couldn't finish that. It just wasn't for me. I wasn't ready. So I wind up going into the Navy. I wind up going to nuclear power school. And so in the first three months, we did everything in mathematics from basic one plus one is two. We didn't even think about attorneys who one plus one could be whatever you want it to be as long as you pay them. But I went from one plus one is two, and by the end of three months, I was doing integral calculus. And so, I mean, it was just the potential was there. It's just I had accepted the defeated statements of somebody that was an authority figure. So like we pray for our young folks today as they're going to school, don't ever tell a kid that they're never going to amount to anything. Don't ever do that. That is the most destructive thing an adult can do to a young person. Do not tell them that. Don't tell them, ah, just wait till you grow up. That's an even easier thing to oftentimes say. Just say, how can we help you? What kind of things are you feeling? Open up a conversation. Do it on text if you have to, but but don't don't wait for the likes or the dislikes. So what I'm saying is, is that advice is always at a premium. How do I know where to get it? That's oftentimes the key. Do you know that Jesus promised you that whenever you would love Him and serve Him, put that last one up if you would. In John 14 are two great statements. The first one is. I am the way and the truth and the life. That means that Jesus is the end all be all of everything. He was there at the beginning. He will be the ruler at the end. The king of kings and the Lord of lords sitting on his majestic throne. No need for a sun. No need for a moon. No need for stars. Because the radiance of his glory will fill the earth with the light that's supposed to be there. So we need to understand that no one is going to come to the Father and get reconciled unless they come through Jesus Christ. But that's not a problem. Jesus is not standing there going, ha, I remember you. Jesus is standing there just like James said whenever we pray. He's standing there to welcome us with open arms. He welcome us with open arms into the family of God. And then the benefits start piling up almost immediately. I mean, they're incredible. Sometimes we get words of encouragement from somebody that doesn't even know us. I know I went one time to John Harkey's uh, meeting up there in Beaver, and my first reaction was, that guy read my mail. 
<laughs> and it wasn't my text messages either. That guy, God had given him a word for us about what we were doing. We had thought about retiring. We hadn't told anybody. This was the night before. Somebody suggested that we might do it. And so John's first words are, without even telling him anything, he says, God wants you to know that you're not retiring, but you're refiring. <laughs> and so we've been here ever since. That's seven years ago, eight years ago almost. No? No. Six years ago. Six years ago. Okay. See, I don't know how many years ago it was. Emma, could you help me out? Tell me how many years ago it was. Oh, six years. Okay. I'm good. All right. The other one is this one. Look at this one. John 14, 26 through 27. But the counselor, not the therapist, he's not going to listen to you whine and cry. He's going to equip you like an attorney would. Well, if we go to court, it's going to be this. If we have to take the stand, it's going to be this. When I send out the interrogatories, it's going to be like this. Maybe the judge will rule like this. Here's the precedent of the case. That's a counselor. Whenever you come before God, he is going to illumine you by his word, by the Holy Spirit, by many other ways. And he is going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And that's what we want to hear God say whenever we get there. Amen. And so otherwise, going through this journey of life, but the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the triunity, will teach, teach, teach you all things. In other words, in areas of morals and ethics and principles, you don't really need Google. We got along fine without Google before. We used to go to what was called an encyclopedia or a dictionary. Some of you don't remember those. I, I can produce photographs. And so we, we need to understand that the aspect of receiving information and guidance is more from the Holy Spirit than it is from Google or Wikipedia. I mean, it really is. There's more stuff that the Holy Spirit wants us to know. Maybe not little trivial facts and figures, but he wants you to know about God's plans for you, God's purposes, God's ways that he's equipping you, God's people that he wants you to associate with, and God's plans for you to reach others in the community. See, one of the things we've discovered is we've discovered that Ephesians 4.11 is what we're really supposed to be about. It's supposed to be about us equipping the saints for the work of God's plans. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Whenever we begin to operate that way, we will see the lost come to Christ because they will want what we have, which is that sense of direction that comes only from the Holy Spirit. Let me illustrate when we were on our vacation, sometimes Emma would punch in a destination, and we would, and we, she would punch it in correctly. But then we would hear that voice, turn right in a thousand feet. <laughs> oh, you just passed it. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> turn left in a hundred feet. Turn left again. Turn left again. Turn left again. Now you're at your destination. Really? Where is it? So we take these kind of voices for granted. I was watching a thing the other day, and it was about an African gray parrot, <coughs> the longest lived, the smartest parrots of all. And this one has in it, near its cage, it has an Alexa, and it has a Google Home. And so sometimes this, this, this bird will speak, and it will say, Alexa, turn down the lights. And the lights go down. <laughs> Alexa, turn up the lights. And it goes down. But you see, and then also it sometimes goes, Alexa, Amazon. And it'll go and it'll get on Amazon. And actually, the bird has a number of things that are on its wish list. And so, I mean, they're not really concrete things. They're just a chattering of a bird mimicking humans. But some people think that you can get guidance through those type of things or even from like a fortune cookie. Has anybody ever used the numbers on the back and won the lottery? No, I didn't think so. Don't play the Utah lottery either. Uh, for all you that are on the phone, we don't have one. Uh, so what I'm saying is about guidance, 
as members of the body of Christ, we need to talk to each other and not just your safe circle. Because when somebody asks you the question I, or makes a statement, I don't know quite what to do, then you need to come back with a spiritually mature answer. Don't come back with something that says, well, if you're as mature as I am, you would definitely know what to do. That means you don't know and you're too proud to admit you don't know. Remember, your direction always determines your destination. You always have to be a lifelong learner and admit that you do have things that you don't know. I enjoy sometimes getting in fellowship with people and just talking about the things of God on a deeper academic level. Uh, it satisfies me. I think it probably bores them to death. But uh, it's something I enjoy doing and because he's such a great God. Uh, I mean, it's just absolutely phenomenal what a great God we have. So why wouldn't we ask him for guidance? Why wouldn't we ask his mature people for guidance? Why wouldn't we look for the signs of him, not in the heavens, not on the earth, but out of his word? I mean, he has crafted time and history to show forth his glory through us. Guidance. You've got to get help whenever you need it. And you have to push to remember that you do need help. Amen? Amen. 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 Stand with me. Amen. <coughs> You have to have help along the way. You can't do it yourself. John Dunn.